With backwards facing feet, a long toothless snout and prickly back, echidnas are surely one of the oddest animals about. Sometimes referred to as spiny anteaters and commonly compared to porcupines and hedgehogs, echidnas are in fact only distantly related to all of them. Where the vast majority of mammals are those mentioned included are placentals and a smaller number marsupials, echidnas are instead monotremes, a group of mammals today represented by only five living species. Four of these are echidnas, which can be split further into two clear groups. The short-beaked echidnas, featuring one species widespread across Australia, and the long-beaked echidnas, of which there are three, all found on the island of New Guinea. The other living monotreme is the platypus, another Antipodean odyssey, and like platypuses, the peculiarity of echidnas is far more than skin deep. Featuring a sprawling gait and no external ears, echidnas are an odd sight to behold. And in addition to this, like the platypus, they even lay eggs, a feature unique to monotremes amongst living mammals. Their reptile-like egg-laying, sprawling gait, low body temperature, and lack of external ears or nipples has led many to denote them living fossils. Living fossils are generally considered to be modern species that closely resemble ancient ones known from the fossil record. The idea being that whilst many other lineages have undergone large-scale changes, living fossils have remained relatively constant. It isn't too difficult, for example, to imagine animals such as crocodiles and tuataras lounging alongside Triceratops and T. rex. Similar are the Hoatzin, whose claws seem to harken back to a more ferocious dinosaurian past and coelacanth thought extinct for 66 million years before its sudden re-emergence in 1938. These animals, the echidna included, often seem like creatures out of time, stubbornly refusing to adapt in a changing world. In reality, however, the story of the echidna is a far more complicated one. As with much in biology, it is less obvious than it may initially seem. If echidnas were living fossils, it would not be particularly controversial to expect them to resemble some fossils. The earliest monotremes known are the Cretaceous Tynolophus and Steropodon. If we are to assume that these resemble ancestral echidnas, we already run into problems. Tynolophus, for example, was a small insectivorous creature, likely weighing no more than 200 grams, similar in size to a brown rat. Compared with the huge, toothless, long-beaked echidnas of today, some reaching weights of more than 10 kilograms, and the idea that they have remained unchanged starts to wobble. While Steropodon presents a form far more similar in size to today's echidnas, it is notably still toothed, and as we move closer to the present, the idea that all echidnas did from this point on was lose their teeth is completely turned on its head. The echidna form is only found very recently in the fossil record, the earliest being a mere 13 million years old with the impressively huge bus echidna-like Megalibguilia. The other monotremes known filling the gap between Steropodon and Megalibguilia all share a particular set of features. Largely, they all look a lot like platypuses. Monotremarsum, although known from only fragmentary remains, at 64 million years old, is the earliest of such creatures, and by Obdurodon, the platypus form is obvious, their skulls showing clear similarities. Even the earlier Steropodon is thought to have displayed a bill, a face far more similar to that of the platypus than any echidna. So if the platypus form is ancient, then where did the echidnas come from? 
it is possible that the two lineages, Echidnas and Platypuses, split tens of millions of years ago, with both forms developing early on. The lack of older Echidna fossils could simply be put down to chance. They would by no means be the only lineage with a limited fossil record. Hippos, for example, are extraordinarily sparse. This could save the Echidna's label as a living fossil, albeit one with very few fossils to compare to. Luckily, molecular analyses, known as molecular clocks, can shed some light on the situation. By comparing the DNA of modern echidnas and platypuses, one can hypothesise when the two lineages split. The analysis by Phillips, Bennett and Lee suggests that instead of a divergence in deep time, the two separated between 19 and 48 million years ago. Importantly, the platypus-like monotrematum predates this point by at least 10 million years, suggesting that the ancestor of echidnas resembled a platypus too. Instead of representing a long-lost lineage of primitive mammals unchanged for millennia, this would mean that echidnas would probably better be thought of as a rather new and highly specialised form of platypus. As is often the case in science, evidence is easier to notice once a framework of understanding is in place. An aquatic origin for echidnas is similarly supported by other features still present in their modern representatives. Whilst their snout may not automatically resemble a platypus beak, as embryos, it is sheathed in a cartilage not dissimilar to that found in platypuses, suggestive of a build ancestry. Similarly, their snouts contain electroreceptors, offering them the ability to sense electrical currents produced by potential prey. This feature is perhaps most famously found in sharks and rays, but it is also seen in platypuses. Notably, this is a feature far more suited to an aquatic lifestyle, where electrical currents are more easily transmitted. One final clue comes from a small molecule known as myoglobin. This molecule aids with the transmission of oxygen. In diving animals, it is found to have a high net surface charge, effectively allowing more oxygen to be stored between breaths. This is of course useful when diving, however less so if living on land. Importantly, alongside being seen in whales, seals and platypuses, this trait is also seen in echidnas, suggestive of a diving ancestry. Together, these features, alongside their fossil relatives, point to a rather unexpected journey, far from that suggested by the living fossil name. Echidnas are undoubtedly strange, but it isn't because they haven't changed. To call an echidna a living fossil would be to suggest its story is a rather boring one, one of stasis. But it is clear to see that it is anything but. From aquatic origins, as with all vertebrates, their ancestors may land. They later return to the water, odd but not unheard of among vertebrates, before taking a turn even rarer this time and crawling back out again. This odd journey formed the strange creatures we know today as echidnas. To call them fossils simply doesn't do them justice. It is likely that similar can be said for many other living fossils. To use the name reduces their story to one of inertia, concealing the diversity that likely remains. It is always tempting to imagine evolution as linear, constantly progressing towards some final form. With that, living fossils appear as though a kind of evolutionary Luddite, stubbornly refusing to adapt to a changing world. Evolution is of course not linear, and is often not predictable. Following no set trajectory, lineages will ebb and flow, displaying different traits and forms. 
Sometimes those forms may resemble those that have come before, but as always, evolution has still been occurring. It is not that living fossil is necessarily dangerous or insulting, and more that it risks hiding brilliant stories. As with the echidna, there are likely many animals dismissed as unchanging, that in fact hide brilliant tales. Echidnas are odd, that is clear, and curious creatures because of it. This is only made more true by their unpredictable origins. Whilst the idea of a creature frozen in time is interesting, the reality of the echidna's journey only enhances their story.